Well, thank you once again to Pastor Peter for inviting me here tonight to speak on, uh, on the subject of the Shroud of Turin. I first heard of the Shroud when I was in grade 11. So this goes back a few years ago. It was in high school. It was a class, a religion class, and somebody brought up and made a pr presentation on the Shroud of Turin. However, I was not that interested in the Shroud until I got saved. It was after I got saved, after I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ my, as my Lord and Savior, that I wanted to hear, I wanted to read everything about Jesus Christ. I read my Bible, I listened to Christian music, and I re read every book that I could at the time on, on Jesus. And one of the books that I came across was on the Shroud of Turin. And I was immediately fascinated with the idea that the burial cloth of Jesus Christ may still be around here today in the 21st century. So what is the Shroud of Turin? The Shroud of Turin is believed by many to be the actual cloth, the actual burial cloth of Jesus Christ. And the Shroud of Turin is the most examined artifact in the world today. It's been examined in the light of science, in the light of medicine, in the light of forensics, in the light of arts, in the light of archeology, span in the light of medicine, in the light of, of archeology, span in the light, of course, of, of the Bible. Many people would say that the Shroud is simply a Catholic thing, so why should they believe in it? And I think it's much more than that. I'm hoping tonight that some of you will get a sense that there's something about the Shroud that touches each and every one of us, that it's there. And I, I think the Shroud is, is an item of apologetics and defense for our faith. My presentation, presentation tonight will be in two parts. The first part, we're going to look very briefly at the historical evidence and some of the scientific evidence for the Shroud of Turin as being the actual burial cloth of Jesus Christ. And then we'll go to a second part, a little bit longer part, where we'll be looking at the Shroud of Turin in the light of scriptures. What does, the shroud, what does, what does scripture tell us about Jesus Christ, about his burial, and what does the Shroud tell us? Following that, we'll have a period of questions and answers, and I believe that all of you in your email today, or yesterday, uh, received the, uh, the text, the, the, phone mess, the phone number for Pastor Peter, so you can text questions to him, and if we have time at the end, we'll go through some of those questions. Before I get into it, I want to emphasize, first of all, that as Christians, we have the Word of God. The Word of God contains all that we need to know in order to get saved. Paul writes, wrote in 2 Timothy um, that all scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So, where does the shroud fit in? Well, a few weeks ago, before this pandemic, Andrew in, our, in the adult Sunday school class spoke of the area of apologetics. Apologetics is simply to have a reason for a defense for our faith. In 1 Peter 3.15, we read that to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. The study of the Shroud comes under the same heading, the same, uh, the same heading as the study of evolution and creation, the study of finding the historical uh, proof for the existence of Jesus Christ. And none of us should be surprised if at some point archaeological discoveries are made that confirm the authority of scriptures. There should be no surprise whatsoever when there's a material trace of Jesus' passage on earth. God is in control. And so as we look at the shroud tonight, especially the second part, we need to remember that God, uh, that Jesus, was the Son of God. Jesus was also fully God, and he was also fully human. And so, as, as a human being, the pain that he endured at the cross, the pain that he endured on his way to the cross, the scourging, the crown of thorns, so on and so forth, these pains were very real. And so I call the Shroud of Turin a silent witness to the passion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what is the Shroud of Turin? The Shroud of Turin is believed by many to be the actual burial cloth of Jesus Christ, as mentioned in Gospels. I'm going to read for you from Mark, Mark 15, 46. It's also on the screen. This is from the ESV. And Joseph bought a linen shroud 
and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in the tomb that had been cut out of the rock. The shroud of the linen cloth is mentioned here in Mark, I believe is the shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin is an ancient, piece, uh, an ancient artifact, an ancient piece of linen cloth approximately 14 feet in length and about three and a half feet in, in width. The later scientific research on the Shroud suggests that the Shroud is 2,000 years old. Now you got to listen to me carefully for this next part. The Shroud contains, contains a life-size image of a man, front and back, who endured a Roman-style scourging a man whose head was covered with blood because of crown of thorn, a man who carried a wooden cross on his shoulders, a man that had been nailed on a cross, and a man whose legs had been broken. The shroud shows that after his death, his right side was pierced by a lance and blood and water came out, and now the shroud now shows a man who is in rigor mortis. All of that is found on the shroud. The source of the formation of the image in the shroud is unknown. It is simply unknown and cannot be duplicated even with 21st century technology. The shroud is also damaged. You'll see some, uh, some black marks on the shroud. This was a damage done by a fire in the chapel where the shroud was held back in 1532. And you see some holes in there. The, the shroud was kept in the uh, silver box. There's a fire in the, in the, um, in the chapel Part of the box melted, part of the silver box melted and cut right through the, uh, one corner of the shroud. And so when the shroud was, was opened up again, here were the, here were the holes that, was, that were done uh, in one of the corner. So the holes were patched, the shroud was repaired, but this explains the damage yet you see on the shroud on, on this uh, slide. The shroud of Turin is called Turin, the shroud of Turin, because it is very simply because it is kept in the city of Turin in Italy. It has been there since 1578. It was owned by the King of Italy uh, for, for over 500 years until nine, uh, 1983, when it was given to the Pope and to his successor. The Catholic Church per se has never owned the Shroud. The Shroud has been owned for the last 30 some years, uh, 38 years, by the Pope and to his successors, but not by the Church as a whole. And here's a very short history of the Shroud. Uh, of course, the crucifixion took place, uh, historians believe, either in the year 30 or 33. And then somewhere in there, after that, between the year 30 or 33 to the year 50, it made its way to a place called Edessa, which is called Urfi today in, in uh, Turkey. It then moved to Constantinople, today known as Istanbul, in 944. It was stolen during the Fourth Crusade in 1204 and reappeared in Lyrae in France in 1356. It was moved to Chambéry, also in, also in France in 1453, and it, to Turin in 1578. Now for the signs behind the shroud. The first photos, photograph of the shroud was taken in 1898 by a person, by a lawyer called Secondo Pia. Secondo Pia was an amateur photographer. Photography was brand new at the time. And he took a, a, a picture of, of the shroud and it was discovered for the first time ever in the history of the shroud that the shroud has what we called negative properties. What you see on the slide on the left-hand side is the shroud as seen by the naked eye. However, when a picture is taken of it, the negative of the picture that you take is the result is what you see on the right-hand side and suddenly the person in the shroud is much more natural, much more alive, much, much, much more natural. You're looking at, and, and, and yet, and so when you look at the picture of the shroud on the left-hand side, you're looking at what we call a, 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 an image with negative properties. So when the highlights and shadows on cloud are reversed, the man of the shroud appears much more lifelike and realistic. The second property of the shroud was discovered in 1976 is that the shroud, the image in the shroud contains what we call three-dimensional properties, 3D properties. Somehow, 3D properties are encoded into the image in the shroud and can be extracted using modern computers. 
This was first discovered in 1976 and led to a revival, if I can put it this way, of his scientific research on the shroud. When the picture of a shroud was placed into a, 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 um, a, a machine called a VP8 analyzer, and VP8 analyzer is a, is a, a machine that takes three-dimensional pictures of craters on the moon and on Mars. It used to be used by NASA, hasn't been used in years. It's been outdated since then. But it's a device that converts image density, lights and darks, into relief, shadows, and highlights. When applied to a regular photo, you put a photo of your family or anything in there, that, the, the, the picture that comes out is very flat and blurry and makes no sense. However, the picture of Shroud of Turin reveals three-dimensional properties. A professional medical opinion, four years after, four years after the Shroud was published, a picture was published in, in papers back in, the, in 1898 to 1900, um, a doctor by the name of Yves Delage, uh, he was a doctor in, uh, in the Academy of, uh, of uh, Paris in France. He was an agnostic and he examined the pictures and declared the image to be anatomically flawless. Following his findings, a number of studies have been made right up to, to this day that confirms that the man of the shroud is absolutely flawless, is, 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 uh, is perfect. In 1950, physician Pierre Barbet wrote a long study called The Doctor of Calvary that, that, that was eventually published as a book. And he stated, uh, he was, a, he was a, uh, a battlefield surgeon during World War I, and he stated that, that his experience as a surgeon during the war where he saw violent death led him to conclude that the image on the shroud was authentic, also anatomically correct, and, and, and consistent with crucifixion in a way that artists would have never known. Botany of the Shroud, in 1973, this is three years prior to the three-dimensional uh, properties, a Swiss criminologist by the name of Max Fry was invited to, to take pollen, spo pollen spores uh, from, from, from the shroud using sticky tape and pollen spores that he found include the 56 different plants that grow in, in the 56 different plants on, on, on the shroud itself. Some species grow in Israel and Eastern Turkey exclusively. At least four from the region of Istanbul, which in those days used to be Constantinople, and some from France and Italy. So it tells us that the shroud had been in those locations at some point in its history. And then very faint images. I mentioned the image of a person in the shroud, but very faint images around the head of the, of, of the man in the shroud are images of flowers. They're hard to see, but they are there. And these flowers are identified by Israel botanist by the name of Evignon Danin. He has confirmed that these flowers are from, in fact, some of them from the area of, exclusively of Jerusalem and of the Dead Sea. And he confirmed that some of those flowers only bloom two months out of the year. These are flowers in full bloom in the shroud, only bloom two months out of the year. And you may have guessed it, they bloom in March and April. Scientific testing in 1978. 1978 was the first and only ever um, um, uh, examination, of to uh, full examination of the Shroud of Turin there hasn't been a full one since then. It was the only one. A number of scientists spent 120 hours over a five day period to study the shroud and their mission statement was, how was the image formed? They were, the team was formed as a result of the negative properties of the shroud and three dimensional properties. They were very interested to find out how was the image formed? And these are the findings done in 1978. It took three years of examining the raw data, and this was a conclusion at the end of it. It was published in 1981. The shroud is of Middle Eastern origin and is made out of linen with minute traces of cotton. It is not a painting. It is no visible trait of paint. There is no ink. There is no dye. There is no pigmentation. There is no stain. The image, the image is on the two top microfiber of the cloth. 
top 1% of a tread. So imagine a tread, let's just blow the tread for, for a picture. One tread of the shroud, the tread would contain somewhere between 100 to 120 fibers, and each fiber is the, the size of a human hair, actually it's a bit smaller than human hair. In a tread, in a tread, only the one or two fiber on the top of the tread, we have a color of it, a color, this colored, and would form the image. This is what was found. The shroud was found to contain real human blood, AB negative, and serum albumin, and though this, the, the picture only appears on top of the shroud, the serum albumin and the, stay, and the, and the blood goes right through the cloth. Um, the AB negative is a, is a rare blood type. It is, however, very common in the Middle East, su suggesting then that the person in the shroud was from Middle Eastern origin. There's no image under the, under the blood. Some of the blood was removed and there's no picture. There's no image underneath it. In other words, the image on the shroud was done after the blood was spilled onto the cloth. There's dirt on the tip of the nose, knee and feet, and I will come back to that in the second part of my presentation. And there's a lack of blood clot break and there's absolutely zero sign of decomposition. Dr. John Heller was part of the original team and I put this slide on purpose he was a biophysicist. He worked at the Institute of um, at the New England Institute in Connecticut. Dr. Heller was a Christian. He was a Southern Baptist. Heller was very skeptical of Shroud of Turin. He says, "I can't be it. It has to be a fake." He just knew it was a fake. However, after spending countless hours examining the Shroud in person and then the raw data afterwards, he became convinced that the Shroud of Turin is not only a relic, but it is an actual artifact of the resurrection. And the person in the shroud is more than likely Jesus Christ. In, in, 19, in, in 1988, all research up to that point, 1988, pointed to the shroud as being the authentic shroud of Christ. Compelling evidence, anyway. It was dated to the first century. Unfortunately, in 1988, uh, a radiocarbon test was performed in the shroud, which dated the shroud to the, fourth, to the, to the four, 13th or 14th century. This, this, the shroud was then declared as a fraud, and some people my generation and older will remember that every magazine, the Newsweek and Time magazine, all magazines, it was front page paper that the shroud was a fake. That was done 30 years ago, 1988. But thankfully, over the last 30 years, and especially over the last 10 years, a lot of research has been done, and it was found that the tests from 1988 were, were wrong, were, uh, were false just as a one point, very simply, a wrong part of the shroud was, was, uh, was tested. So the shroud, the, the, the part of the shroud was tested, it was correct, it was in the 14th century, but it was part of the shroud that had been repaired. And so a, a separate part of the shroud should have, been, should have been done at the time. It was an error that was made, and that error stays with us to this day. So in 2005, different tests were, were, uh, were, were uh, con conducted, with the, which dated the shroud to the fifth, um, to the uh, first uh, century. Dr. Julie Fenty is a researcher. He's a uh, professor of mechanical and thermal measurements at the University of Padua, Italy. And he says this, he wrote this, he says, the result seems clear. The result seems clear with 100% probability and negligible uncertainty that the man of the shroud is Jesus Christ himself. Now, what, uh, now we've looked at the historical perspective. We've looked at the uh, uh, scientific perspective. How about the word of God? What does the word of God say? Well, let's have a look at scriptures. And we're going to take on two hat. First of all, we're going to keep uh, looking, looking at the shroud from, from a uh, scientific perspective, but also from pilgrim perspective. And the first thing we see, the, 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 the passion of Jesus Christ starts in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we read in scriptures, in the Gospel of Luke, that in being in agony, he, Jesus, prayed more earnestly than his sweat was like great drops of blood falling to the ground. All four Gospels speak of Jesus being in the Garden of Gethsemane, down at the, the bottom of the Mount of Olives, but only Luke speaks of, um, of uh, the great blood, of, of the sweat of blood that Jesus was producing. And this is not surprising, because Luke, who wrote that gospel, was a physician. He was a doctor. 
And as such, he, he, he mentioned, he spoke of an actual medical condition that still exists, still exists today, and it's called, it's a rare condition called hematidrosis. And hematidrosis is simply that when a person is in deep psychological or physical trauma, blood will come out with a sweat. A rare condition, a rare, sorry, a rare a side effect of this rare condition is that the skin become very, very brittle, very, um, uh, uh, very sensitive to any kind of pain. So the first pain that Jesus would have suffered that night, the, the night of his betrayal, was the kiss of Judas. When Judas kissed him on the cheek, that kiss alone would have been painful. And this is the opinion of medical officers, medical doctors. So imagine the pain that he then, then suffered on the cross, the scourging, the nails, the crown of thorn. Later in chapter 19, we read, we read of Jesus appearing before Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate ordered Jesus Christ to be scourged. A Roman scourging at the time was very well known, and very little is said in scriptures. It simply says that Jesus was scourged. The image on the shroud, though, reveals a lot. It reveals that, that the man of the shroud was covered front and back with, 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 a, with dumbbell-shaped scourges marks likely made by a tool called a Roman flagrum. And you can see a picture here, a representation of Roman flagrum. An actual flagrum was found um, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the ruins around Vesuvius and Naples uh, back in the 70s to confirm that this is what a flagrum used to look like. A flagrum was simply a short whip consisting of heavy leather balls at the end of lead attached the, the near, near of the, the end of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of, of the tongues. These were used by Roman as a form of punishment throughout the empire. And although on the shroud, all scourge marks are approximately the same size, they differ in their intensity. And some of them actually contain blood in them. And some of, some of the scourge marks on the shroud can only be seen through UV light, through ultraviolet light. You cannot see them with your naked eye. Most of the wounds are at the back of the man, some of them are at the front, but there are no scourge marks on the arms, suggesting the man of shroud is, as has its arms lifted up above him, attached to a column, attached to a wall or somewhere. And, and so there's no scourge marks on the, on the, um, on the arms. The, uh, the most detailed count of, of wounds on, on the shroud, on the body of men in the shroud, is connected with scourging, is 372, 372 individual scourge marks, 159 in the front and 213 in the, in the back. Then after his scourging, we read in Mark 15, 19, that the soldier again and again struck him in the head with a staff and he spit on him. Oh, here's a picture again of the, uh, the Lorma flagrum and showing it with the scourge marks. So they struck him in the head with a staff and spat on him. The man of the shroud was badly beaten. There's no doubt about that. The right side of the shroud, the right side of the face is swollen and there's evidence that his nose is broken. Not the bone, but the cartilage of, the, of, the, of those nose was broken and part of his beard is missing. And here's a passage from prophet Isaiah that may sound familiar to you. And is this a prof this a passage from Isaiah, which is a prophecy of the coming Messiah, Isaiah 56. It says, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. And here's another passage from Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. That is certainly the case with the man of the shroud. And yet, despite the, the marks of indescribable pain, the man of the shroud, his face has a serene, a great majesty, a great peace in his death. Then we read of the crown of thorn. We read that his Roman soldiers made a crown of thorn, put it in his head. We often think of a crown of thorn as being some sort of headband around the, around the, the forehead, around the, the head. And, uh, but according to what we see on the shroud is actually the, it, the, the, the crown of thorn actually covered the whole entire head, covered this entire head. And medical officers have calculated, I've seen 30 puncture wounds all over his head. And on the shroud is very clear in the picture here that there's blood flowing on the left hand side, on the right hand side, on his forehead, and in the back. There was a lot of blood that was, uh, that was, that, uh, 
came out as cause of the because of the crown of thorn. And then we see the next um, we uh, we read in chapter 19 of John, the soldiers took charge of Jesus and had him carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha, and there they crucified him. Most Bible scholars agree, and modern archaeologists confirm that the man that crucified people in those days would not carry the whole entire cross on their on their shoulders, but would only carry the the horizontal beam. The vertical beam was always planted to the ground. They would carry the horizontal beam only, and that beam would have been attached with ropes, and um, and and so the person made its way to the place of crucifixion. The carrying of the beam of the cross is actually seen on the shroud. On the um, on the um, on your screen on the left hand side, the picture of the shroud from the back, the dorsal part, you see two white circles. And inside these white circles, first of all, you see the scourging on his back, but inside these circles, the scourging marks are braced as if a heavy piece of wood uh, 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 rubbed against it. And so the scourge marks are very, are, are blurred because of piece of wood. And this is confirmation that the person carried a heavy piece of wood on his shoulder. As well, because the person in the shroud or become crucified people have their hands tied with ropes to the, to the vertical part, to the horizontal part, if they fell, they could not help themselves. They couldn't prevent the fall with their hands and it would fall flat on their face. It is believed this is, it was at that point that Jesus broke his, that Jesus, that the man of the shroud broke his nose. I mentioned earlier that back in 1978, a, a, a rare time of limestone was found in the shroud. The limestone is found on the nose, on the, on the knees, and on the feet. And that kind of limestone is called travertine aragonite. The signature, the, the, the dust, the, the, the mud, the, 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 the particle, the limestone that is found on the shroud is identical to the limestone found in Jerusalem today. In other words, the man of the shroud was crucified in Jerusalem. Then having reached Golgotha, we read <clears throat> that it was the third hour and they crucified him. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was pierced for our transgression, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. And Jesus, the, the, the nails, you can see a picture there, um, of, of the exit wounds, the black spot, the red spot on the, on the shroud picture on the left is the exit wound, exit wound of, of the nails. It is believed that the, wound, the, the nails were, were driven through the wrist and not through the palm of the hand because a body would not be able to support, that the palm of the hand would not be able to support the body would fall off the cross. And so it shows on the shroud here that you, you, the, the um, wounds were done through the wrist now in Hebrew, in the Jewish culture, and in Jewish, uh, yeah, in Jewish culture, uh, the, and language, um, the wrist is actually part of the hand. So you've got the hand and you've got the forearm. So it was a junction of the arm and the, fore, and the forearm that he was nailed. Now folks, I believe, with depth my heart, I believe that what you are looking at at the moment are the very hands of Jesus Christ, a picture of Christ. These are the actual hands that healed the paralytic. These are the hands that fed the hungry, that healed the blind. On the hand, you can, only, you can also see only four fingers rather right, than five. An experiment were done on cadavers, corpses that just, just passed away, with permission of the person before passing away, where nails were driven through the wrist. And when that happens, when the nail driven through the wrist, it hits a certain nerve, which causes the thumbs to fall inward. And so the thumbs are not visible in the shroud because they're, they're on the inside. And then you see the, the feet uh, were the uh, shroud researchers believe that Jesus' feet were one on top of each other. And you can see very, very clearly here, the left foot has very little blood, but it's the right foot that has most blood with, when, when it was applied against the, the, uh, the cross. And so you can see very, very clearly in there the uh, area where he was crucified. Jesus spoke several times from, from the cross. And for me, the most memorable, memorable words were, 
Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And then he told the thief who believed in him, this day you'll be with me in paradise. His last words were found in John chapter 19, verse 30, and his words were, it is finished. My mother tongue is French, I'm from Europe originally, and in French, they translated, that verse is translated as, it is accomplished, it is accomplished, it is finished. The face of the man on the shroud is not that of a, of the, of a tortured face of an angry criminal. It is a face which is serene, the man of the shroud, I believe, whom I believe is Jesus, had accomplished what he wanted to accomplish, and he died in peace. In scriptures, we read that Jesus accomplished the will of his Father on the cross. He died to reconcile the world to himself. The work by Jesus was finished, and through him we have eternal life. And then on the shroud, we, uh, on the, in the Gospel of John, we read that the Jewish leaders wanted the bodies, the three bodies, the two thieves and Jesus, to, be, to come down from the, cross, from the crosses because the next day was a Passover. It was, it was a Sabbath. It was a very special one at that. It was a Passover. So Pilate ordered the Roman soldiers to break the legs of those to hasten the dead. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead, so they, didn't, they, not, they did not break his legs but it pierced his side, uh, the side of his chest, where we read that blood and water came out. We have two items here. First of all, the breaking of the legs was, was a customary at the time. And the reason being is that a person on the cross when he was hanging there, a person could not breathe until they elevated themselves on the cross, on their feet, take a breath and go down again, up and down. They take a breath and, uh, and down again. By breaking the legs, a person could no longer breathe and would die, within, would die within a minute, within seconds. In the case of Jesus, the legs did not need to be broken because he was already dead. The man of the shroud, his legs are not broken. The second thing is that he was pierced on the side and very surprisingly on the shroud, you see a very, very, a very clear cut picture, image of where the lance actually went through. And the image is so precise that doctors are able to say that the lance went between the fifth and sixth rib of the person of the shroud. And you see this black part, this black spot on the left-hand side of, um, of, uh, of the screen. And this is where the lance entered the, the body. And it's a very clear cut, about 1.9 inches in length, and half an inch in width. And we have the proof that the man of the shroud was already dead when this happened because the, 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 the wound did not close by itself. It stayed open. And then the Bible tells us that water and blood gushed out and there's water and blood on the shroud. The blood is serum albumin. It looks like water, but it's, it's, a, it's a liquid that comes from the heart, from, from, from the body. Um, the surgeons confirmed that water would have come from the envelope of the heart and the blood would have come from the right-hand side of the heart. And the perfect cut in there suggests to archaeologists, confirms to archaeologists what kind of weapon was used and if it's that of a Roman lens. And then when Jesus' body was taken down, of course, the blood by the force of gravity, the blood came out of the body and was and sp spilled onto the shroud. And you see the, the, the color there was actually highlighted by computer to show where the, where the, uh, the, the, the pool of water uh, flowed. According to medical authorities who have examined both the shroud and the gospel narratives, the cause of death is this, and I'll read it. That death resulted primarily from hypovolemic shock and exhaustion and asphyxia. Jesus' death was ensured by the thrust of a soldier's spear into his side. Modern medical interpretation of the historical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead when taken down from the cross. These findings were published in the prestigious journal of the American Medical Association back in 1983. That resulted primarily from hypovolemic shock and exhaustion asphyxia. And then we learn from the gospel that Joseph of Marithea asked Pilate for permission, permission to take the body down and he wrapped in, in, the, in the cloth. The burial of Jesus Christ had not been complete. According to Jewish custom, a body, the body, his body was not washed. Jewish laws state that when a person died a violent death, when 
blood is spilled, that the blood must remain with the body, and so therefore the body is not washed and is buried with, with the blood. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own, in his own new tomb, which is cut out of the rock. Matthew, Mark, and Luke speak of single linen cloth. John, on the other hand, speaks and seems to imply a, cloths in, a, a number of cloths in the tomb. And that, if that is the case, then the Gospel of John would be in direct contradiction with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We read this in John. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, plural. And so John uses the word linen cloths in the plural. And this has led to the belief that somehow he was wrapped like a Jewish, like an Egyptian mummy, different cloths. And the explanation, the explanation for this is very, very simple. Jesus and, and the man of the shroud <clears throat> was wrapped in a single linen cloth. And then separate pieces of cloth were wrapped on his neck, at his waist, and at his ankles to keep the body and to keep the shroud together. So there's no contradiction between John and what we call the Synoptic Gospels. And here's the best part, the empty tomb. Early in the first day of the week, while it was still dark, they came to the tomb and they found the tomb was empty. We read that John was quick, right first at the tomb, bent inside to have looked, then Peter went in and, and, and the, the two of them were inside. And it says, it, 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 we read in John 28, that John would reach the tomb first also went inside after Peter. He saw and he believed. Jesus' body had disappeared, and if the body was not inside the shroud, it's because it came out in very, very mysterious ways. Now, what John and Peter saw was not only the empty tomb, because the, the body could have been stolen, but they saw the empty shroud, and we believe that the shroud simply collapsed onto itself, and the body, the body or Jesus rose from it. The, the, um, the, the, shroud, <clears throat> the shroud not only shows the passion of Jesus Christ, but it also gives us evidence of his resurrection. A scientific examination of the shroud has, has shown that there's, there's absolutely no sign of decomposition in the shroud. The person was in rigor mortis when the image was formed. So within 36 to 40 hours, the, the body would start decomposing, which means that after roughly 40 hours, the body would have left the shroud. 40 hours, Friday night to Sunday morning is roughly is 40 hours. There's, and although there's clear signs that the body was in the shroud, was in that, the, the shroud of, known today as shroud of turn, there are no signs of a body being removed from the shroud. The blood clots are not broken. They're still in peace. They're still there. There's no tearing of the cloth when you remove something sticky, a, 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 a body that's been there for a few days and in a piece of cloth you remove it, you see some strings coming out, so some, 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 yeah, some piece of threads. There's zero of that. Somehow the body simply left the shroud and undisturbed, it does not disturb the, the linen cloth at all. There's, there's um, it seemed like the body in the shroud simply disappeared in a way that science cannot repeat. Science is unable to explain. The only explanation for that is beyond the realm of science, and the reason it is is because it cannot be observed, cannot be repeated again. And the very best explanation for this is simply that burst of energy within, within the tomb, within the shroud, within the body, uh, there's a burst of energy that occurred, raising Jesus from the dead and leaving an image on the cloth. The cloth and with an image not made by man is a material witness of the suffering death of our Lord. And I believe it is a silent witness, a silent witness of Jesus' power, victory over the devil. And I believe that when we see the shroud, when you see a picture of the shroud, we see Jesus Christ himself and we see the very face of God. Remember, Paul tells us, Colossians, that the Son, Jesus, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. The shroud, I believe, is a truly a silent witness of Jesus Christ.